Good morning, everybody. I'm so excited. I don't think I need it. Sorry. Awkward. Well, hey, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Yosimar Reyes. I am predominantly a poet, a writer. Um, I am from Eastside San Jose, story and capital on the 25 to 22, um, just in case you're from there and you get lost. Um, I'm super excited to be here with you. Um, most of the work that I'm doing right now is kind of discussing storytelling and discussing the ways in which we build narratives, right? Oftentimes when we talk about storytelling, we think of books, we think of literature, we think of writing. Um, but oftentimes, very seldom, do we also think of ourselves as kind of as vehicles that carry stories. Um, and for me, uh, I'm someone that embodies multiple identities, um, I find that the way that we talk about where we come from um, is very interesting. And I feel that uh, it's important for us to become agents of our narratives and become be in control of the story, of our lived experiences. Um, I titled this presentation for More Than Tragic Stories, and I'll get a little bit into why that title. Um, but I want to start off with a poem, that way you know, like, because sometimes I do these presentations and then I forget to read poems, and then people are like, I don't know, you're a poet, but you didn't read a poem. Because um, I get all into the, the theory of it. So I'll start with this um, poem. It's Taro Lo Que Soy. Um, I think it translates to why I am. It's in Spanglish, so if you don't speak, Spanish, and just use the context clues and find yourself in it. Um, that's how I learned English. Um, <laughs> this is my nature. The truth in my heart, the breath in my lungs. Yo soy the one you fear, the one that got away. So el único que se te fue. Yo soy el hijo que nunca será padre, el nieto que nunca será husband. I am the near and the far of earth and sky and sol y la luna. Soy everything that is in between entre el hombre y la mujer. Soy el ser que por tu ignorancia no quieres reconocer. I am the one you define with hate. The one that doesn't fit your labels but manages to reclaim his name. Yo soy cualidad. Y aunque digas que esta es la misma canción, el mismo poema, te repito que nosotros seguimos hablando de compasión. Yo soy de fuego y tierra, de mares que liberan, de muertes silenciosas. Yo soy la muerte que me deseas. I'm of destruction and reparations, of freedom in cages. I'm the bird that still sings praises. Y con todas mis fuerzas te digo que tu odio me libera. Porque más que espíritu enjaulado, yo soy el poder de la conciencia. I was like, see, I need to down with the you. Um, um, but I, I want to, I know that right now it's very interesting that we're meeting, and I think this is like the, the we're kind of slowly all getting accustomed to coming back out and being out in public and being in, in, in spaces, right? And I think over, I think over like the, uh, a year and a half that we've kind of been surviving amidst this pandemic. It's been very interesting in the ways that we've all kind of been impacted, right? Some of us, you know, tested positive. Some folks have family members that they're grieving. It's a collective. But if anything, one of the things that this pandemic has kind of taught us is the way that some of the systems that are at play impact us in a different way, right? When we talk about intersectionality, intersectionality meaning that we all embody different identities and based on how we interact in what kind of social setting, those are identities are impacted at different, at different proportions, right? In San Jose, California, you know, um, Mercury, Mercury News came out with there were zip codes that were disproportionately impacted with positive COVID cases and COVID deaths. It so happened that those zip codes were 95127, 95122, 95116. I, I'm blanking out the other one, but all these were zip codes located in the east side of San Jose. The east side, predominantly, Inhabited by Latinos and inhabited, uh, in, uh, inhabited by um, immigrants, most undocumented immigrants. Um, I was raised in 9512125, uh, and so I was living in Los Angeles at the time and, my, uh, and commuting to San Jose. My family was in San Jose. Um, but I started noticing how just the lack of resources that were for my community. And then one of the things that was very memorable was also that there was a lot of positive COVID cases with our elders who were a vulnerable population. Um, and then, you know, we started discussing the factors. Why is it? 
oftentimes because we talk about social distancing, but how can you social distance when you have like three families living to a bedroom apartment? And then how can you not stay home and not go to work when most of the industries that are immigrants or undocumented immigrants work in are <laughs> service industries? And so, and then on top of that, we kind of see the digital divide in which people don't have internet in their homes or they don't know how to navigate internet or the second thing is language barriers. People who are monolingual Spanish speakers can't access resources because they do not know how to speak the language or advocate for themselves. And so when I started noticing all these factors in my neighborhood and as somebody that writes about these communities and, and, and does artwork around these communities, I felt like, well, I have to use my platform to kind of bring attention to these disparities. And so the first video I'm gonna show you is titled What About Us? Um, it initially started me documenting being a caretaker to my grandmother, but it ultimately it transformed into the fact that I wanted to talk about community care and how oftentimes for certain communities who are have to exist out of, out of government aid, we become the only caretakers for ourselves. So you're going to meet my abuelita and her comadres, um, the people in her WhatsApp group. Um, <laughs> those are not, <laughs> so um, yeah, I wanted, and, and they they're super super dope. We shot this video at right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, the video was shot by my homegirl Gina Saint. She's from Oakland. Um, but we went into that neighborhood, and initially I was very hesitant to have the señoras on the camera because I already know that just being out in public as an undocumented immigrant. But I think what was most significant is that they wanted to be on camera and they wanted to participate in this project. And then I'll tell you like the benefits of, uh, of this um, project. It's not about us, you know, so don't scare. Mi abuela is 85 years old. And since we began social distancing, abuela's distraction has been spent in our living room watching telenovelas y las noticias. I spent my days stuck in my room, pressured by writing deadlines and Zoom calls. I try to break down to her how I can still work through the computer in what a Zoom call is, but it goes over her head, so she leaves me alone for a couple of hours until she comes barging in the room reminding me, No has comido en todo el día. We sit down to eat, and through conversation, she explains to me the latest updates with COVID-19. Abuela doesn't understand that through social media, I'm already aware of these updates. Munición gives her tips on how to disinfect the house and precautions she should warn us about when running essential errands. She knows that she's high risk being that she's 85, so she's very attentive to what the news informs her. Trump announced a stimulus check of $1,200 given to every American. Excitedly, she asked, ¿Y nosotros? ¿Nos van a dar? I have to explain to her that undocumented people who file taxes with an ITIN number do not qualify. She shows concern for her comadres because she knows they aren't as lucky as her. She knows she has me, and with my English, I've been essential in helping navigate resources for her. She also heard that Gavin Newsom in California announced an eviction moratorium. He gets eviction. I explained to her that this means landlords cannot evict people for not being able to pay the rent. But it does not make sense because even if you're not able to pay, your rent will accumulate and you will need to pay back rent. For many undocumented people who live paycheck to paycheck, this will create a system in which they will be indebted to landlords. No es justo. Si nosotros trabajamos, Abuela is aware that during this pandemic, undocumented labor is the backbone that is holding America together. These essential workers are the same ones we've seen go viral for being asked to speak English while providing customer service. These are the workers so many opposed to making a living wage with the excuse, if they wanted to make more money, they should have gone to school. As if education did not equal student loans and was a guarantee of making a living wage in this country. These are also the farm workers we essentialize for wanting to prove that brown hands pick their salad. Abuelas comadres are like her, non-traditional workers. They are street vendors, recycle bottles and cans, work cleaning hotel rooms, nannies, or go door to door selling barricade products. She calls them, and when they have questions, she hands me the phone so I can explain to them the resources provided locally. Las señoras are grateful for my intelligence, and before hanging up, say, Gracias a Dios que te llamé. Thank God I called you. In the same regard, Abuela has placed the uncertainty of this moment in prayer. She sits with the giant print Bible in her lap, and with a magnifying glass, she reads scriptures. During this quarantine, she has vowed to read the Bible cover to cover. She says her faith is the sole reason she has been able to survive this country. 
and I believe her. It takes a divine power, unearthly energy to be undocumented in America. While the rhetoric in this country is that we are the invisible enemy, Abuela and her comadre build networks of support for one another. Through phone calls, texts, and WhatsApp messages, they check in on each other. While the Trump administration weaponizes these moments to vilify us, we prepare for the next battle that lies ahead. The invisible enemy, a group of senoras praying for the fate of the undocumented. And those are the Bada Senoras that I uh, worked with in this project. Um, one of the beautiful things, I just wrote that piece because I felt like, oh, I needed to be expressed, right? And what ended up happening is that I started going to use my social media, and through my Instagram, I managed to, people were like, oh my God, who are these ladies? We want to help out. Um, and then through, I started fundraising. We started something called the Comadre Fundraiser. Um, and then we teamed up with Siren for Immigrant Rights in San Jose, California. If you are not aware, um, they are a great organization. And if, you know, if, if anybody ever needs immigration services or a nonprofit organization that directly connects you to uh, immigration screening, read different resources. So definitely Siren for Immigrant Rights. Collectively, we ended up raising about 17, 17K, and we were able to assist 23 undocumented senoras, which was super badass. Um, I think that was my proudest moment in the fact that I realized that it, sometimes we think that art and poetry is just that cute thing you do, um, but if you activate it, and if you're able to kind of be able to capture the narrative and connect with people, it can def definitely have a direct impact on, on the individuals. Um, so obviously, La Señora, now that they see me, they want to give me free food all the time. Um, uh, but it's super, super amazing that, and I think for me, that's the biggest thing, right? In this moment, hopefully, as we're coming out of this pandemic, we're all kind of coming to, to a better understanding on how, what it looks like to show up for one another, to show up for other communities, to be informed about the issues. Oftentimes, you know, we have our um, unconscious bias that tells us. That's why, you know, if you're uh, ever not knowing where to stand, if, whether what happens politically or policy-wise, I don't want to tell you what to vote for or whatever, but always stand with poor people and always stand with the workers because it's the only way that it makes sense, right? So, um, one of the things that I do in my work is really try to capture, I, I am a DACA beneficiary, I have DACA, Deferred Action for How Childhood Arrivals, an executive order signed by Obama in 2012 that went through the legal authorization for work for two years, every two years I paid the government $495 and they gave me this work permit and I could pay my taxes and continue to, you know, work. Um, it does not say, it doesn't mean that undocumented immigrants don't pay taxes, undocumented immigrants pay taxes to something called an ICE hit number, but oftentimes that is the point that a lot of people make, um, which is very interesting how people want to justify our, our, our work on how much taxes we pay when, you know, billionaires don't pay taxes. Um, um, this, uh, this book, I, I, I pulled is a book called The Undocumented Americans. It was published last year. Carla Bonito Vicencio is a writer. She was also um, one of the first undocumented books graduating from Harvard. Um, she published this amazing collection of stories that captures the, the, the lives and the lived experience of immigrants. One of, the, one of the most notable chapters in there are the, um, the second responders, right? In 9-11, we talk about the significance of the first responders, but we never talk about who are the people that clean up the, the rubble and the debris from those buildings. Oftentimes, the people that come after a natural, um, like a hurricane or a natural disaster, the people that clean up these cities are actually undocumented immigrants. Um, that they pay to build these houses and, and, and they rebuild the, the, reconstruct a whole city. Um, but I pull this quote specifically because one of the things that we see within pro migrant narrative is that we kind of embolize the monarch butterfly as the symbol for the natural course of migration. The monarch butterfly being an uh, animal that travels freely between Mexico, the US, Canada, right? Like this kind of natural cycle. But what ended up interesting for me, I think now that we are in 20, or oh, about to go into 22, 2022, is the fact that we kind of 
in a way pacify immigrants. There's this idea that if we present the narratives of immigrants as these people that are just hardworking, good-hearted, and you know they don't want to cause any trouble, that somehow um, folks will kind of feel like a little bit more welcoming and less kind of intimidated. Um, but for me, I feel like that kind of messaging is a little kind of um, disarming to the people that have this lived experience because at the same time, it kind of teaches us to sit politely while we let these kind of atrocities happen to us as we get, you know, all these abuses that we get subjugated to in the workforce. I don't know if you come from immigrant parents, but I was always the one that would get in trouble with my grandparents because I would always speak up. Uh, I, you know, it, 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 sometimes you gotta know, read the room. Um, because I would argue with everybody because I was just mad. And then my girl was like, shut up, you're gonna get me fired. Um, but don't do that, you know, read the room. Um, I, uh, one of the things that I talk about a lot in my work is that I came here when I was three years old. I passed here in 1991. Um, and was very raised very much Americanized. I think this is the only picture I have where I'm physically in Mexico. Um, and, um, and and so this is like the only, I don't even have memories of coming here, right? I My first memory is kindergarten with his Miss Jimenez's class and Clifford the Big Red Dog and wondering why this dog was so big. Um, but, <laughs> I also remember that during a school, one of the biggest things that we taught, right, every February is Black History Month. Um, and one of the things that we taught, we were taught in Black History Month, is how a group of people kind of, kind of changed the discourse or the ways in which this country operated. Um, and I remember learning about Black folks and their, and their fight for equality, right? And for me, as a brown immigrant kid, kind of feeling like, oh, people can really actually shift and change the paradigms in which we think. Um, this quote is by Maya Angelou, who is an amazing poet um, who I, I, I love. Um, but I think this, I pull this because I think it has to really think about the words that you use to describe yourself and how you identify. What are your identity markers and what is it that you express when you think about these things? Maya Angelou says, I believe that a word is a thing. It is a non-visible, audible, only for the time that it's there. It hangs in the air. I believe it is a thing. I believe it goes in the upholstery and then the rugs into your hair and into your clothes and finally even in your body. I believe words are things and you live on them, right? Uh, think about that. Think about the words that you use to describe yourself. And I think we talk about language, and oftentimes people think that language is passive, that language is just something you do. But obviously, language has the power to build and break spirits. Language has the power to build confidence. It also has the power to make you feel small. So I think it's very important for me to talk about. That's why I have a really interesting relationship with the word undocumented. You know, oftentimes you see people who are like, no, undocumented, I'm afraid, sure. Um, I feel like, I think I, I, I I, I tread lightly with that because I'm also aware that that is not an identity, it is a social conditioning. Just like how I grew up poor, um, undocumented is something, a condition that informs my identity, but it's not, you can't, I don't know, maybe if you're racially profiling me in Arizona or something, you're probably like, oh, that person's undocumented. But you can't really see it, it's not a physical trait, it's not a, an attribute, right? As opposed to my queerness, my queerness is in my vocal cords, is how this hair is laid, is how I put this outfit together, is how I walk, is how I talk, is how I navigate throughout the course of the world, right? Um, Oftentimes, I talk about the citizen gaze, which is very interesting. If we look at the way the media or the, the movies you've seen, the documentaries you've seen on Netflix, the characters you build, lo que ves en las historias que ves en las noticias, oftentimes I talk about when I was asked to tell my story, it was because the people wanted me to convince citizens that I am worthy, that I, I, that I should justify myself. But honestly, that is exhausting. It is tiring, right? Like, I don't really want to convince. Like, if you, I'm from Eastside San Jose. Eastside San Jose, the motto is, if you like me, I like you. And if you don't like me either, I don't, I don't like you either. Like, stay over there. Um, why am I going to you, right? And so I talk about how oftentimes this gaze is in which we tell our story. We tell us, even as people of color, when you tell our story, is to try to convince 
other people, that you're people, that you come from, that we have values, that we're valuable, that you should like us, that you embrace us. So I'm just, it's exhaustion. It's, it's exhausting to all constantly have to prove yourself and constantly have to demonstrate that your lived experience is valid. Um, I talk about the undocumented agency. Undocumented agency being the idea that I have a choice into what I choose to participate or not. Agency is the ability for you to choose. So if I want to be a hot mess up here, I can. If I want to do a, tell a joke, I can. Like I don't have to exist between these rigid ideas of what my story should be. Um, and also, I think also realizing that there's so many of us, right? Oftentimes when you think about documented immigrants, you think of a community that is immobilized by fear. You think of people that are constantly like in constant anxiety or that we're con we, we don't leave our houses and or we only creep out at night. Um, but the reality is that we've been existing since forever. We have built, built lives. Some of us have our own companies. People are artists, we're philosophers, we're thinkers, we're professors, we're doctors, we're nurses. We're people that exist among everybody. The only difference is the fact that we don't have access like many people. Um, and so these are some artists that I look up to that I think are doing really, really dynamic work throughout the country to bring visibility to workers, to bring visibility to communities that oftentimes are not seen as people that contribute, right? So um, Brian Herrera, um, Felipe, Felipe Baeza. And what I find more interesting about some of these artists is that the fact that we are taking our own narratives and we're building it independently, we're creating stories outside of the paradigm, we are not necessarily working. I think for me that's the difference. Are you the subject of a story or are you the agent of the story? The subject being that somebody, you're telling the story to someone else and they're cutting and editing and molding you into whatever character might be, be, right? And the agent being that you have the authority over how you want to be represented. Um, I used to do a lot of interviews um, back in the day, you know, I think right now it's very interesting Can we do like the merger of kind of uh, celebrities and um, social justice. So they were asking me to speak on campaigns, but they would always edit me out because I was too happy. Um, or because I would crack jokes. They were like, oh, tell me your migration story. I'm like, bro, I don't remember the even I don't, And I, I think that I, it didn't fit the mold of that. Because people wanted me to cry. And honestly, me crying on camera is not cute. Like, it's not, especially, imagine you're like at an event and then they put you on crying on the video. Like, oh, look at this poor person. I'm like, no, I don't like that. Um, but I definitely will cry for a fellowship or a scholarship. Let me know. Um, <laughs> This is another um, video, um, Undocumented Tales is a web series on YouTube, written, produced, directed, all the actors are documented, it's in the third season, and it's amazing because we they're, they're building on their own. Um, Rocio is on Amazon Prime, um, amazing, Dario Guerrero, I graduated from Harvard, captures the, his life, his mother has a terminal ill disease and then self-support to try to find, um, navigate the medical system. Um, Children of the Land, Barcelona del Castillo, another amazing book that came out last year. Um, Company by Javier Zamora, he's from El Salvador, uh, which is also very important to understand. I think when we're talking about representation, especially um, Latinx representation, oftentimes it's very like Mexican-centric, but there's places like Centro America, El Salvador, Honduras, different people that have different histories and impacted um, by different policies. Um, <laughs> That's my abuelita. This picture we took last year. So my abuelita's sister um, is from is in Mexico, and through a program through um, uh, the Mexican um, uh, through the state, they have this program for elders. So I don't know if you have an abuelita, but maybe look into it. Um, if you have grandparents, they actually try to make it easier for grandparents to get a visa to come to the U.S. Obviously, because yes, I'm getting those for that, so I'm like, I don't think they're gonna come to work. Um, so I think they're trying to make it easier for them to come. So she finally got this visa, and after like 20, 28, 29 years of not seeing each other, this is the first time they're like seeing each other and hugging each other. And I think for me, when I think about the way in which our lives are often impacted by policy, often we don't really, it's very hard for us to understand what is at stake and what is the trade-off. And the trade-off is this, right? The trade-off is that oftentimes we think that we come to this country chasing something, but at what expense? 
What are the things that we leave behind? Um, and so my abuelita is always talking about going back to Mexico. We've been here for 30 years, and she's always complaining about the food because she says in Mexico the food is better. And I'm like, girl, we've been here for 30 years. Like, your palate is already cleared. Um, <laughs> but um, Tony Morrison tells us this, and I think this is what I want to... My message, biggest message is this, right? When I talk about the distractions within your life, having just feel, feeling like you have to justify your presence or constantly explain who you are, Toni Morrison reminds us that the function, the very serious function of racism, it is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language and you spend 20 years proving that you do. Somebody says you don't have your head is in shape properly, so you have scientists working on the fact that it is. Someone says you have no art, so you dress that up. Someone says you have no kingdom, so you dress that up. None of this is necessary. There will always be one more thing. And that's the idea, I think, that when we are talking about what's happening in our country, um, and when we're, I think, these kind of conversations about talking about really calling out what is anti-racism, how can we show up for better one another, it's not necessarily in relationship to one another, it's what's happening nationally. If you're not, if you were not, uh, um, if you were turning off your TV and socially distancing in early January and you did not know what happened at the Capitol, it's this idea that there's certain folks in this country that believe that this is rightfully theirs and it belongs to them, ignoring the fact that there was a presence way before this became an empire, ignoring the fact that so many of us are impacted by global policies and that's why we're here, right? Um, but at the end of the day, this is what what we're here for, our families, and making sure that we are manifesting um, the lives that we came pursuing. Um, I, I, I am a product of community college. I went to Evergreen Community College. I, I just remember how much I struggled. I took, would take like two buses to get a class. Um, and, and you know, the buses always lag. I hate buses. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe we should invest in a better uh, public transit system. Um, but uh, after that, uh, and I remember how hard it was for me to navigate that because at the same time I'm in school, but I'm worried about the fact that because I'm in school, I can't work and I can't help my family and I can't be of assistance to them. So I think for many of us who come from working class backgrounds or who come from poor neighborhoods, we kind of, you're in your classroom, but you can't concentrate because you're like reading sometimes. I always talk about, I took early British literature. If you ever take that class, it sucks. Um, <laughs> but I remember reading these stories and I'm like, okay, I get it. They will epic, a journey, a moment, yes. But bro, my grandma is out here pushing bottles, uh, recycling bottles and cans. Like, how is this applicable to my life? But then I also understood that the trade-off was that this moment in time is a sacrifice, but at the end of the day, it's gonna be an opening. I am an opening, I am a key, I am gonna open the opportunities for my family. I graduated, I transferred to San Francisco State University. I, I got there accepted, I only applied to two. I wanted to go to Berkeley, because I we, we're smart, we can Berkeley what? Um, but I did not I, I did not go because I realized that that was gonna be a lot of money and it's gonna be a lot uh, for me stressing about finances and I can't worry about that. So I was like, you know, I was like, um, I treated um, my college experience like a reality TV show. Like I'm not here to make friends, you know. Um, and that's how I went. I went spirit on. I transferred. I went to San Francisco State. Um, I decided to major in English. Everybody's like, Yo, you, should do, you should do ethnic studies, you should do, uh, not that those are, are, are not important, but for me it's like, I already embodied this experience. I wanna take something that's gonna challenge me as well, and that I'm also gonna challenge that, that place. Um, thankfully, I graduated um, and I built connections and often, and this is where I tell you that it's a, yes, it's about what you know, but it's also about who you know. So definitely network with people because that's how you get opportunities. I graduated and then I got hired for a national nonprofit organization. I became the artist in residence at Define American and moved to LA. And then I have this life, you know, this LA life. And then like in the movies, we have to come back home and like face all the things you left behind. That's what I'm doing right now. Um, 
when I talk about stories and when you're thinking about your narrative and of your lived experience, I always think about this, right? Because oftentimes we get taught that our stories are trauma-informed or trauma-induced. Um, the more suffering, the better. Um, and this is, I, honestly, you learned this from our parents too. I've been like working with my abuelita to try to document her narrative. And honestly, her story is like a Rosa de Guadalupe, but with like climax all the time. Like suffering, 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 suffering. I'm like, girl, can you tell me one thing you love about life? Um, <laughs> but I think I ask these questions because I think they're so important. Uh, will the story honor my family? Will the story speak of my legacy? Will the story inspire my undocumented mother? Will the story give undocumented community mental break? Will the story make my undocumented father laugh? Will the story make me cry of happiness? Obviously, I can tell you about how hard and difficult it was and all of that. But I don't think that it's a value because I, for me, it's like we're already existing. All of us are one problem away from a breakdown, right? And I think it's very important for us to also be aware of what we consume and how we relate to one another. And I don't want to feed that void. There's enough stories of that. There is enough of that, right? And I don't want to feed that. I want to talk about the ways that despite the adversities, I'm still trying to find loopholes and ways to maneuver and, and get in. Um, questions to think about. What is undocumented power? Or what is power in general? Um, right? Um, think about the last time you felt powerful. One of the things that I think that happens oftentimes in communities of color or communities is that we get taught to be humble. Um, it is cute, right, to be humble and say, oh yes, thank you, blah, blah, blah. Um, but at the same time, that is also hinders us because how many of you are, when you come to write your personal statement, you talk, you talk about your accolades, you're like, bro, I ain't shit, right? Like, I can't, I can't. But obviously, you gotta make it to you, make, you gotta make it to you, make it. So definitely use the language to do that. Uh, but use, um, yeah, think about what power means to you and what, what was the last time you felt powerful or like the, those moments because those, it's very easy for us to remember trauma but it's very hard for us to really kind of like really acknowledge our accomplishments and be like, bro, I did that, like that was dope, like I was, that was not something I expected. Um, so really, really think about those moments because those are fleeting and oftentimes we give those away. Um, and these señoras, I think these señoras for me are like the testament. Um, I've kind of been working and assisting them. Obviously, La Regaño, I get on their case. Yes, they're somebody's mom, but I, I am like a hardcore teacher. I'm like, señora, you have all this time to be watching novelas. You could have learned on Google how to build a Gmail. Um, <laughs> nobody uses Hotmail no more, lady. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I think for me, again, journaling. For me, journaling is the way that I kind of maneuver. I know therapy is super expensive sometimes, and I'm sure that you have counseling resources here that you should definitely take advantage of. Go back, go throw all that mess to somebody else so you can go about your day and be like, okay, I'm happy now. Um, but obviously, writing for me, I feel like if I did not have writing, it would not be, it, I, would know, I, I wouldn't be able to know how to navigate this. Writing is a moment for you to reflect within your own self and really acknowledge the things that you're going to. Obviously, we are all going through different stresses, different anxieties, we all have problems. Yes, this, com this presentation is focused on undocumented immigrants, but that's not go to say that we're the only ones facing the, uh, confronting these issues. We're all impacted by all these things uh, in a different way, right? We're all impacted by, uh, by poverty, unemployment, all these things that we're facing, we all have a different outlet. So I think journaling for me is the way to do it. Um, that way, when you're in traffic and somebody cuts you out, that doesn't ruin your whole day, that you're driving for five miles already pissed off at the person, and you just sit there in your sand and be like, okay, I hope they crash, but you say it quietly. Um, yeah, you can find more of my stuff. I, my videos are at youtube.com. Um, you'll find videos, uh, writing, and different things. Um, and then if you want to find, I have my Instagram, you'll see very, and should I be any resource? I think for me, I try to make myself as resourceful as possible, meaning that, you know, um, if there's an organization or something that directly is connected to something that you are navigating, I would be more than happy um, to be an assistant. So definitely um, reach out. Um, but yeah, and that's that picture of me looking like a snack. Um, <laughs> I'll close up with a poem, and then I don't know if there's questions or, um, or but I don't know, did I talk too fast? I talk too fast. Um, okay, this is how I'm working so I pick my entire time. Um, <laughs> um, okay, this, po um, this poem is titled, um, My Revolutionary 
Uh, oftentimes, you know, uh, people are like, oh my God, you talk about the immigrant stuff. Yes, the immigrants and all of that. But what about the, 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 the queer people and whatnot? I'm like, bro, it's, it's, it's all in there. Um, this poem is titled, uh, uh, My Revolutionary, and I wrote it because, um, honestly, when I was growing up, when I was growing up at 16, I think it was like the super like hard year for me because I realized that all these things are at play. At 16, the world's around, unraveling before me. I'm growing up in the hood. I'm growing up in extreme poverty. My grandpa's parents recycle bottles and cans. Um, dude, I, I'm realizing that I need a social security number to get a driver's license. Um, I hated everybody in my school that drove. I was like, oh, I hate you. I can't do that. Um, and then, uh, at the same time, also understanding that I'm also queer. I'm like, bro, like, Jesus, throw me, throw me something here. Like, I can't be all of these things. And I always thought of all those things, being poor, being queer, being undocumented as a deficit. I'm starting at a negative, right? Like, I am below the balance, like, credit collectors are calling. Um, and so I realized that I found writing, and then I started kind of understanding that these things were actually gonna be informing my identity and they're actually gonna become my biggest assets because at least I'm relatable to people. At least I can people can relate to all these things. Everybody can relate. Everybody knows, well, I don't know, you know, I don't wanna assume, but I would think that, you know, everybody has kind of had that moment where you need $2 to take out a 20 from the ATM and you're like, bro, let me go to Coinstar. Um, this is kind of living that I was doing, but then I realized um, that in my writing, I kind of wrote into these experiences and I was speaking up in public and then other people would come up to me and be like, bro, like my grandparents do that too, or like, oh, I know what that feels like. And then slowly I started understanding that there's a universal truth. Yes, I'm writing about something specific, but there's something universal about, you know, all of us trying to achieve something. So this one is titled uh, My Revolutionary, and I wrote it for someone that I've met. Um, and then I helped me understand that actually my greatest was not, especially in Latino communities, right? They tend to be very much and homophobic. Um, but then I learned that it was actually one of my biggest gifts, and now I learned to celebrate it. So it goes like this. You tell me you don't like the city, that these buildings is concrete, numbs the senses, cages the spirit, and baby, your spirit was meant to be free. You, my love, were born to be revolutionary. Free like the tobacco you offered to blow blessings free. Like palabras sagradas que salen de tu boca y las rimas femeninas y masculinas that you buzz here on stage, you are my revolutionary. Not a guerrero, but a healer, because in times of conflict, mi rey, you heal. And more than body, I must agree with you that you are spirit, because more than your flesh, I'm in love con el corazón que tienes. You are the reason why I love men with noble hearts, the reason why I don't mind sharing a better with someone. For men like you, I will ride a million barks, get lost in Oakland and find your house beneath the brightest star. Mi vida, you come from tierra, where the spirits of those who fail to cross over Rome, you come from el desierto, but baby, we all know you are not deserted. You got me, and together we are four spirits, like the four directions, you have the creator behind you. You're his creation, his masterpiece. In this journey you are traveling, you have managed to leave your footprints in my heart. I carry your breath in my hair, your teachings in my two spirit. You are fluid, como los ríos que nuestra gente ha cruzado. You remind me that the only possessions we have in this world are our bodies and our voice, and the combination of the two must be used to honor the spirits of the pasados. This life is a ritual, and in its sacredness, I'm so glad I'm able to hug you. You are my revolutionary, and as you make your transition back home into the arms of your mother, into the lips of your father, I ask that you take this poem with you. I ask that you take a memory of me with you, plant these in la tierra que te vio nacer, en esa tierra que ha sido bautizada con la sangre sagrada de nuestra gente, and I will assure you that wherever you be, this love will sprout anew, como el sol por las mañanas, this poem will shine on you, now go, to wherever home is, knowing that in San Jose you leave a bramble that has nothing but love and respect for you. In the meantime, I will stay here in this shitty city, in this cage, singing and singing till the system crumbles, the borders break, till the earth shakes and our people become awake. I will be here singing and singing until the day we're all free to return home. <laughs> Um, I, am I good? <laughs> See, me, not me over here talking about, no, don't be a good immigrant. And I'm like, oh, am I okay? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, but this is kind of, um, yeah, currently what I'm doing, um, I think all this ties to like the lived experience. 
I left that organization to find American. It's an amazing organization if you want to look them up. Um, they're a national nonprofit. They work with media. So they work with a lot of TV shows. So a lot of some of your favorite characters, uh, Superstore, NBC, they have an undocumented, well, they, I think they wrapped up their last season. Um, Mateo um, is undocumented and gay. They, we help develop and work with the writers in that. Um, Grey's Anatomy introduced an undocumented character. And she was white, because they were like, oh, there's white undocumented people. Let's put the diversity in there. Um, <laughs> but obviously, you know, what happens in TV shows, they're like, OK, we don't want, OK, we touched the issue, but we want to get rid of her. So they ended up deporting her. Uh, but she self-deported to another country. Um, and she became a doctor there. Um, and different ethos, hi, different shows. And what you're going to see right now, um, it's, yeah, if, if you're seeing in your TVs and how media is, sh is shifting, is that you're seeing a lot more characters. You're seeing a lot more queer characters. We're seeing characters that are trans. Right now, one of the, the amazing things is we're learning about people who are gender non-binary. So you're kind of uh, kind of having this language. And the idea, again, being that through art, art creates a condition in which we kind of start getting educated more. And so through that, we create a culture um, in which we're learning more, right? You're seeing all these discourses that are happening. If you're in the shade room in the comments, you're seeing a little knots eggs and the how, you know, disrupting those spaces. But the idea is that, that knowledge is that. And for me, it's amazing because when I was growing up, that didn't exist, right? In Latino culture, we had Juan Gabriel, and everybody thought that it was funny to come in Juan Gabriel as a joke. But I'm like, bro, that is an icon, so thank you. Um, so like the different things I think you're gonna be seeing, seeing into that. I, I left that organization, and I know currently what I'm doing is I just launched my own company, um, which is super awesome. Again, if you're not aware, if you have parents that have small businesses, you can actually apply to get an LLC. So an LLC is a small business uh, license. And then obviously if you have the same protections as just uh, uh, um, from working as independently. So I just launched my, my thing and then yeah, hopefully, I'm gonna be hiring some people soon, little citizens, and treat them like immigrants. Like, yes, get to work. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You're gonna put me in jail. Uh, but, but no, I think like that's the amazing thing. I think for me, what. I, what what I realized is that I didn't want to live my life thinking of the limitations. I didn't want to think about the, the one of the things that happens when you grow up with a status or grow up in poverty or working class communities is that before you manifest something, you start already thinking like, oh, I can't do that because I'm poor. I don't have money. Oh, I can't do that. So I wanted to get out of that. I don't want to live in that. And so I think the pandemic, honestly, uh, the word for me is abundance. And that's what I want to manifest. The fact that if I am consistent with my work, it's going to there's no way that it's not going to pay off. Consistency is the key, right? Yes, it's talent, but it's also a rigorous consistency and it's going to manifest. And then right now, I just got a book agent, so I'm super excited because now I got to work on my book and hopefully soon. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, this is me. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'll be around if you want to talk and whatnot. Thank you so much. God bless America. <laughs>